welcome to the bell midnight I'm your host joseph michaels joined by john mack on this episode we have the story of the buddhist monk who hijacked his nephew's body to become a buddhist monk again the story of the boy who discovered his own killer and the hearsay child bride so how are you ben <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he hijacked his his uh, whose body? His son's body? He said his nephew's body. Is that what I said? Yeah, his nephew's body, so he could become a Buddhist monk again. Is that like a Buddhist monk squared? Yes. Is that a, a, a increase your chakras or whatever? Does that align them better? And of course, he's very creepy about it. Yeah, which we'll explain. Oh, good. I was hoping for some creepy stuff tonight. Let us begin our journey. So this episode, obviously, we're going to be talking about reincarnation. We also have a story that's a little bit of a walk-in, as we're going to explain. I'm slightly disappointed. I thought he was just going to, like, wear his skin or something. (laughs) Oh, you thought he was going to pull one of them? Yeah. Uh, So tell me, what do you know about Thailand? I know that it is, from what I understand, a pretty beautiful country. I know that uh, China has some problems with it. I know that all the former... Chinese royalty lives there. They have an enormous sex market. And a lot of creepy old guys go there to find uh, questionable women. <laughs> Man. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's all facts. It's, it's hard facts and drop it. You picking them up, son? We'll get into our first story here. Oh, but before we start, Ian Stevenson, MD. And let's, uh, so a lot of these cases we're going to be looking at they were researched by Ian Stevenson, who's a, he's a psychiatrist, and he's the founder and the director of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. And he's researched loads of cases for over 40 years, over 2,500 cases, I believe, of reincarnation. Okay, cool. That's what he specializes in. So a lot of this stuff is all coming from his work. And we're going to get into... One story that I found pretty interesting. We were going to talk about the James Langer case, but it was, um, man, that's a that's a case I'm pretty sure everybody knows of. It's the most popular reincarnation case ever, even though he, I don't think he's a fighter pilot. No, I know what you're talking about now. Of course, like where where is he now? Oh, no one knows, dude. He's in Louisiana. <laughs> he's living with the swamp people, man. He's 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 mudding, going for some crawfish. Unreal. Can't find him out. Well, they find him, but you know, you know what pissed me off about it is it's like, okay, well, where is he now? Is he a fighter pilot now? Like he said he was going to be when he was 14? No answer. That's interesting. Oh, he's just living with his family, dude. <laughs> he's, in, he's in mom's basement playing Fortnite, getting sick kills. Yeah, I'm like, well, like, what, is he, is he like married or, or is it the Fortnite thing? Which is it? Probably the Fortnite thing. Why don't you call Domino's? They probably know where his house is. And I found out that I, well, I looked up on LinkedIn. I'm like, okay, let's see if I can find him on LinkedIn. And there, there is one guy with the name who was in the Marine Corps, but he's in Houston. He's not in Louisiana. Cause, but apparently the new information is he's in Louisiana. I got tired of digging around. The story sucked anyway, but we're doing something different. <laughs> okay. I, I don't think, doesn't the Marine Corps not have planes unless they're the Harriers or something? Or no, now the F-35? I don't know. Uh, well, they do the carrier shit. Yeah, I guess they do do the carrier shit. Uh, I think. I don't know. I don't know either. All right. So like I said, it, it comes from Dr. Er, Ian Stevenson, MD. And like I said, we're going to be exploring his cases. And one of his cases is about Nai Lang, who consciously was able to experience his own death and rebirth and how he became Chao Kun Raj... Sooth fuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Chao Kun, I'm not even going to try the last name. All right. Okay. But he is affectionately called by a nickname, Choate. Choate. Okay. But here's where the story starts it starts with Nai Leng. And he was born in the year of 1863 in the small village of Ban Kraton. And that's by the city Surin in Thailand. So that's by the Cambodian border as well. Oh, fun. Yeah. And there are uh, like pockets of Cambodians in that area that speak a language called Khmer. K-H-M-E-R. Okay. That's important later because we're going to talk about how he develops xenoglossy. Okay. 
yes, there's the understanding of languages that he was never taught. Oh, is that what it's called? Xenoglossy? Yeah, unless I read it wrong. It sounds like a finish on paint. Sounds like a cool move. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Nailing is, he's the eldest of seven children, and he's very close to his sister, Nai Lang. I, oh, no. He's very close to his sister, Nang Ring. So this is going to get confusing very fast. Yeah, I, I've got to have a boy. But I will clarify. Okay. When Nai Lang, when he was 16 years of age, he decided to enter a Buddhist monastery. So, of course, they have their Buddhist scriptures and everything there. And, but it's all written in Khmer. Now, Nai Lang's native language, language is Thai. But he was able to learn to read the scriptures that were all written in Khmer. Now, it's, it's not easy because it is an entirely different language and all the alphabet, alphabet and all the characters are completely different. But he continued to study here at the monastery and he became so adept that he was eventually able to teach the other monks how to read the scriptures. So he became a professional at it very quick. Pretty impressive. There's all the Buddha stuff, the meditation. That's all part of their central activities as well. Throughout his life, he continued to meditate every day. Time marches on. Nai Ling is now 25 years old, and he decided to leave the monastery to become a farmer. And it's said that he made good money trading goods, and he would trade goods frequently to Laos. So he had to learn Laotian, and he became extremely fluent in it because that's how he had to do business. Okay. He did get married and have three daughters whose names were Papo P. I'm being respectful. I'm not laughing. Should I even say their names? He had the three daughters. No, you you must say their names. <clears throat> I want you to say them with enthusiasm. He married and eventually had three daughters whose names are Pa, Po, and P. Or Pi. Let's say Pa, Po, and Pi. Uh, though he was no longer a monk, Nyling continued to be a devout Buddhist and would meditate every night, as we mentioned, right? Yeah. So now we're going to talk about a sister who... He, Keep in mind, he was very close to. So this is Nang Rin, the sister, who was only a year younger than him. So she eventually marries and has three children as well. But when she's at the age of 45 years old, she becomes pregnant once again. Unusual. Unusual. So the year was 1908. So during the pregnancy, uh, in contrast to her previous ones, she all of a sudden becomes deeply, deeply spiritual. And decides to become a Buddhist nun. Okay. She goes to the monastery, shaves her hair, puts on the white robes, right? And she moves to a temple called Wat Tai Ken. So that's the name of the monastery. Now, the, the monastery is nine miles away, or 15 kilometers, from Ban Kraton. And that's the village where Nan Ring, the sister, and Nai Leng lived. Okay? Mm -hmm. So Nai Leng develops an illness and dies! Plot twist. Now, while the sister is in the monastery, just before she returns home to deliver the baby, the brother, Nai Leng, develops a fever. Now, later on, there's accounts where he says he was sick on and off for several months. But now, it's come in October, it's gotten worse. So, the sister, Nang Rin, travels back to Ban Kraton during her brother's illness and arrives home where she wants to deliver the child. And she does. She delivers the child. On October 12th, 1908, this is important, okay. who was named Chao Kun, I'm not even going to try the last name, but he would be known by a nickname, Chuate. Well, that's what we're going to use. Nai Lang was ill for six days before he died on October the 13th, 1908, okay. at the age of 45. No, no, okay. The child was born October 12th. Nai Lang died October 13th. Yeah, so he died the day after. Day after. So a lot of people would say, it's not reincarnation then. We got you. It depends. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of people in the U.S. who would say, yeah, there wasn't a soul in that body until it was 20. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. But this is something that Ian Stevenson talks about in the original paper, where he, he doesn't have a explanation for this discrepancy, even though he has seen it before, and they call it a split incarnation. So it's been documented before. Are the, are the dates nailed down? Could it perhaps be a local record discrepancy? That's interesting. 
Maybe. Because, you know, like if you were trying to get accurate records, even from the U.S., you know, in some places, even as far back as like 19 or, or as soon as 1940, like the records are not good, or if even there. It would depend whether or not the physical records exist and how they were gathered, because, uh, you know, uh, maybe it could just be like understood within his village. And if someone gets a couple of days wrong or someone gets someone could even get a year wrong. Like, I can't remember what I was doing this time last year. You know what I mean? That's a good point. And that's a good thing to keep in mind. But the, the story, the recount of events, everyone knows everyone that was present says the baby was born first and then they found uh nine lang dead oh that's fair that's hard to get that the order of you know things that happen screwed up that's fair yeah so like i said ian stevenson said there's a, like a split reincarnation ian stevenson also refers this to this as anomalous dates referring that there's an overlap in timelines mm -hmm. or like i said split reincarnation the soul is able to split its energy into more than one body so it looks like in this case, the soul of Nai Lang was animating both the body of Nai Lang and the body of the infinite Choate at the same time for the period of about a day. Okay, so it's weird. I mean, it could be if if time is purely linear, like like humans experience it. It could be, but you know, yeah, that's true too, because we do hear stories about how time is a weird thing like that there's no past future present in like the the view of the cosmos like everything's simultaneous right everything's simultaneous or, or not even that like if you look into some avenues of science you're starting to explore whether or not if you can keep going straight you know many many times faster than the speed of life you don't end up back at the same part because the universe wraps around on itself Ooh. so i mean like you know like when you're talking about a concept like time time is influenced by gravity I mean, there's already something that can influence the perception of time, at least. Yeah, well, explain that one, flat earthers. <laughs> Whatever, globe hard. <laughs> <laughs> we we got to do a, a, like at some point a multi part show on the flat earth stuff because that stuff is. I played a role where I'm trying to sell it, and you keep debunking me. <laughs> yeah, but like my, my debunks will be like so sort of accurate but then i'll just get obnoxious and dismissive so like we can just both be stupid <laughs> <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be a good like april fool's joke show yeah what you're essentially talking about is just putting out trash for the viewers we're just gonna put out <laughs> trash for them. here eat this garbage up here uh let us uh, i don't want to review his account i do want to review his account before he died when he was laying sick, he was remote viewing his sister at the temple. And there's accounts that they were visiting each other in dreams. But yeah, so there's there's stories that Nai Lang was remote viewing his sister while she was at the monastery, nine miles away, like I said. And they'd visit each other in a dream. So they had, you know, they had a special connection like that. I guess that's what it kind of shows. We're going to go back to before Nai Lang dies while he's sick on the bed. This is August of 1908. And this information, it comes from Chowate's autobiography. None of this is from Nai Lang. It's not like he wrote this down and told anybody. This is the nephew now growing up and recounting this stuff in his autobiography. Okay, so there's only so much you should know. Exactly. But wait till you hear about how much he does know. Coming from his autobiography, he says the following. In the year of 1908, when I, as Nai Lang, was 45 years old and had already had three children, Nang Rang, my sister, was in the seventh month of pregnancy. It was the eighth month of that year. I, Nai Lang, had already been sick on and off for several months. He goes on to discuss how he used to remote view his sister in the monastery. And he talks about this special connection where he would see her. And he says, all along I knew and saw her activities. But on the day of her return, when she returned to Ban Cranton, he says, I felt somewhat confused and could not remember anything. I then were recalled that I was sick. One day there were four persons in the house, three female relatives, and Nai Lang's wife. I opened my eyes and saw and heard what they were saying to each other. At nine o'clock last night, Nan Reen, the sister, delivered a cute little boy. I was thinking that if I were normal... I would have gone to visit her also, but there I was lying sick, 
All I could do was merely listen to their conversation. He goes on to say, at the moment he felt anguish and wanted to change from a lying position to a more comfortable one. He tried to roll over. He couldn't maintain his balance and he fell back onto his back. He then says, thinking that I might be better off, I decided to go to sleep. I sighed deeply a few times and closed my eyes. At this very moment, I felt as if I was back to normal again. So here he probably just died. Probably, yeah. If he felt normal all of a sudden. He says, I felt stronger and could move much more rapidly from place to place. My body was light as if I had no weight. I was so glad that I rushed up to join the conversation of my relatives, but no one noticed me. I grabbed this one's hand and pulled that one's arm to draw their attention. Still, no one did anything. Don't know where he's dead. Yeah. How long would this have gone on if, if he hadn't realized? He goes on to say, the time came to prepare another meal of the day. My relatives were getting ready to leave. One of them felt Nai Lang's feet. I was then behind her trying to seize her hand and shoulder. I yelled out, I am here. I am no longer sick. I have recovered already. Do not be afraid or frightened. Do not panic. I am all right. However, I could not make them understand. They were crying and moaning. Some of them went to tell the other relatives and friends of the neighborhood. So they found his dead body while he's roaming around in the spirit. At this moment is when he says something weird happens. He feels omnipresent. Says, At that moment, I felt as if I were omnipresent. I could simultaneously see people coming in from two or three different directions. Moreover, I could be there to receive them all at the same time. I could also hear their voices as well as uh, see things quite clearly. He said he can move very rapidly from the far places he could see unobstructed. Yeah. I mean, that sounds pretty par for the course, really. As he's experiencing this omnipresence, as he puts it, he says, at the same time I was thinking, I am an appointed head of the hosts. I am great. I am the master of ceremonies who has the final word on all matters. Well, where'd this come from? I have so great an authority that none can possibly instruct or encroach upon it. What? He goes this full, like, uh, full ego there, right? Yeah, that's an odd shift. Is he egotistical in life? There's no record of it. Interesting. He says he was very grateful that he didn't uh, feel sleepy or tired. They didn't feel thirsty or hungry. He then goes on to three days later where he witnesses his own funeral. Uh, yeah, so he talks about how he was preoccupied with receiving guests. Uh, the women who came to help uh, went to sleep in the house while the men slept in a disorderly group in a building constructed especially for the ceremony. On the porch of this building, three elderly men were sitting around the stove. They were either chewing Thai gum or smoking cigarettes. They might be considered night watchmen of a sort. All of a sudden, the thought of Nang Rin, his sister, flashed into his mind. Now what's he up to? He remembers, I heard that she had just given birth to a child. I have not yet paid her a visit because I was so busy receiving guests. But now I am free to go. So he goes to pay a visit. Did I mention he might hijack something? <laughs> Is he gonna? Does this man hold up anything or, or hold anybody at knife point? <laughs> What's interesting about it is it sounds like a more of a walk-in story than a reincarnation story. Yeah, I'm not getting the impression this is the same guy. I, I maybe this guy thinks he's the same guy, but I'm not getting the impression this this is the same. I may have forgotten to mention this. This story is coming from uh, past life memories in childhood. That's the case. Uh, the researchers were Francis Story and Ian Stevenson, MD. Uh, it's from the Cases of the Reincarnation Type, Volume 4, Thailand and Burma. Published in 1983. Enjoy. I'll pull that one off a shelf and cross-reference. Yes, please. Please. Right, so he decides to go and visit Nai Lang. Yes, he decides to go and... No, Nai Lang's the guy. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta leave this in. This is good, fantastic. This will teach you a lesson about picking stories with exotic names. I know. I hope you learned your lesson, buddy. <laughs> I have. Uh, so Nai Lang decides to go visit the sister because he, he's yet to greet the baby or steal his body. No, well, yeah. As you would. So he decides to go and visit the sister. 
though he says, at the time, uh, I was at the place where the monks were sitting. He turned in the direction of Nang Ring's house, which was approximately 200 meters away. No sooner had I decided to move than I was there. Just happened. The child, as my relatives had said, was really cute and adorable. Aw. I thought to myself, how can I possibly have a chance to touch him and to give him my heartfelt kiss? Nang Rin, the sister, was then sleeping with her right hand over the child. Before long, she opened her eyes. And she saw me. And she said, oh dear. My dear brother, you have already departed for another world. Please go to that place which will offer you happiness. Please do not make any more appearances to your brothers and sisters, nor feel concerned about them. This was the only time that people ever noticed me and talked to me. He goes on to say, I felt so awkward that I went and hid. I was leaning on the wall in front of her room, facing the north. So the sister has now noticed him and has seen him. And this, she seems to have an instinctual reaction. He's up to no fucking good. Wow. you, Wow, man. This guy's like a good Buddhist. Oh, uh, he's, he's he, he, yeah, there's a lot of good Buddha. There's a lot of good everything. He's hanging around. He's, and, and we know, we, hey, look, I'm from the future. I know how this story ends. <laughs> so now here's where it gets weird. He, he's, he says, after a while, thinking that she was now asleep again, you know, after creeping around for a while, he says, I came out to get another glimpse of the child. She again opened her eyes and said the same thing to me. I went back to hide. I told myself that the time had come for me to decide once and for all. I was torn between two feelings, although I would like to say, yeah, I should go. Indeed, I must go. But before leaving, however, I wish to get another good look at the child. We got ourselves a skulker here, folks. Yeah, this is not the child bride story. Thank God for that. This time I dared not approach, lest she reapproach me once more. Thus, I poked only my head out. After obtaining a good look, I started to go away again. So, this guy's lurking around and creeping around and waiting for her to go back to bed in his spirit form. Yeah. And his sister's got the, the wherewithal to know that something's not right. Like, she's instinctually waking up and telling him to back the hell off. Exactly. This, this ain't the same guy. How do you know, man? Were you there? Were you there? Dude? Is yeah. <laughs> let's get in an argument. Let's argue. <laughs> um, no, man. Her instinct is telling her something. Your instinct doesn't lie to you. It doesn't lie to you. It's connected to something else. It's not. It's not purely biological. She's not shooing him off like he's an evil spirit. She just told him to leave. Yeah, that's shooing him off. Okay, fine. All right. Oh, oh. So here, here's where it goes totally crazy. Right, so after he says, after obtaining a good look, I started to go away again. Okay, so now he's leaving, right? Okay. But he says, as soon as I turned, my body began spinning like a top. I could not regain my balance. I tried to cover my head, my face, and my ears with my hands before I fell unconscious. At that point, I thought I was dead. Truly dead. He died. He thinks he died again. So he's aware he's, he died. Yes. Oh, yeah, he's aware he died. So he thinks he double died? He double died. Oh, that's, that's a shame. Which is weird, too. He says, I did not know how long it was before I regained consciousness. I was wondering where I was. Concentration and recollection, recollection <clears throat> told me that not long before this, I was nigh lang. I felt myself full of vigor, recalling all of the past. I wondered why I was in such a helpless condition. I felt somewhat frustrated. He goes on to say uh, he was very happy he could move because when he was sick, he, was, he went into great detail about how miserable he was that he couldn't move. But now he is now in the body of Choate. And now he is rejoicing that he can move again and he can move around, lay on his stomach and stuff. He says that when he got old enough to be able to walk and talk, his grandmother came in. His grandmother came, instead of calling her that, he said, I used the word mother. I was governed by my past acquaintances in my own memory. The grandmother was surprised that Chuate called her mother and asked, well, what is your name then? Right? Because this is a, you know, Buddhist culture. They believe in reincarnation. It's not super weird. 
Mm-hmm. So Chuate responded, it's, it is Lang. I wondered why they could not recognize me. I was Nai Lang right then and there. What a fucking idiot. He's got gaps, too. He's got gaps, man. Yeah, he does have gaps. There's enormous gaps in his consciousness. That he's not even realizing he's now in a different body. An interesting thing uh, I've heard about walk-ins like this, because that's why I, I feel like this is. Yeah, I feel like it's that, too. When they first get into the body, they're, they can't remember anything. And it takes a while for it to come back. Yeah, it's, it seems like he might not even, even, like, obviously he's not aware of the past, but while he was going through moments in the past, it almost seems like he wasn't even aware of it as it was happening. Almost like mechanical reaction. Like, or drunk. You know what I mean? It's so weird. When this happens, Nang Ring, the sister, says, No wonder I saw Brother Lang sometimes during the post postpartum period. He must have been reborn. And then she asked, if so, what is your name again? What is your wife's name? Where did you live? They start to quiz him on everything. And after this great quiz, they concluded that Nai Ling had indeed been reborn. So he answered to their satisfaction. He was able to name everything. And when he was learning to speak, though his mother explained who his aunts and uncles were, he still insisted to refer to his uncles and aunts as his brothers and sisters, as if he was still Nai Lang. He also would call his grandmother his mother. So now what about his daughters? Now as time goes on, so Nai Lang's daughter, Pa, was 24 years old when he died. When Chuate was 4 years old, he recognized her and said, I am your father, which isn't creepy at all. Uh, he called her by her baby nickname, which is interesting. It's reported that at first these statements would annoy Pa, the daughter, but as time went on, she became convinced that Chuate was indeed her father reborn. Two daughter, one daughter down, two to go. What about Po? What did Po say about all this? The second daughter. Wait, let's hear Po's opinion. The second daughter said that as a boy, Chuate would refer to incidents in her father's life that Chuate could not have known about. She said that Chuate, as a child, recognized persons known by her father on sight and called them by their names. There's obviously something going on. So, now what about Pai, Nai Lang's third daughter? We call that Chuate became angry when Nai Lang's daughters, that is Pa, Po, and Pi, Pai, would not refer to him as father. You, you don't say. <laughs> Can you imagine like, a little kid getting pissed off? Yo, I'm your dad. you dead. dad. I'm your dad. Give me my juice box. Nai Lang's sister said that Chuate recognized her by name as soon as he could speak. As a child, Chuate also recognized Nai Lang's wife and called her by name, and he also correctly named other people Nai Lang had known. No, I, I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt here. I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt that he just knew this stuff because of some supernatural reason. Well, he talked about how he creeped around and waited until he could jump into the body. Well, he didn't jump in. So you know how the Dalai Lama, you know how the Dalai Lama is chosen by picking his favorite top or toys? Chuate does the same. As a child, Chuate would correctly separate items belonging to Nai Lang from items that would belong to other people. So he passed that test too. I mean, hell, that's Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama level. He's obviously got information that he shouldn't have. They discuss where he has spontaneous memories based on geographic memory. And they go in to discuss deja vu and how that works. It's geographic memory, maybe. That's their theory. Don't hold anybody on this. Here's the good part. It's where he develops xenoglossy. Okay. At the age of 16, Chowate decides to become a Buddhist monk again and enters a monastery again, repeating the pattern of Nai Lang's life again. The monastery had Buddhist scriptures written in Khmer, as we know. Chuate noticed monks reading these Khmer texts, and though he was only schooled in the Thai language, he took some of the Khmer manuscripts to his room, so he stole them, to see if he could decipher them. Remember, it's a completely different language. Chuate couldn't read it at first, but on his third attempt, he could understand them without any difficulty. Like jogging a memory. Exactly, like, oh, I gotta get the rust off here. And Chuate describes his experience. He says, the book had 10 pages, those 10 leaves. I went through it in about an hour, but being afraid that he didn't get it right the first time, he started again. He said the second time took him about an hour as well. 
He said he wasn't satisfied with that either, so he read it for a third time. And he was very happy and surprised that he could read it without any lessons before. And to give you an idea, a lot of people will put great effort into this year in and year out, yet only a few succeed. Well, I'm not surprised he was able to do it. I mean, he'd already done it. So. Yeah. He began to read and write Kemmer as well. And he said from then on, he was able to read any canonical work, be it in Thai or Kemmer. The reason is simple. I was already quite well versed in it since I had been a monk as Lang. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, everybody kind of gets that. He wants to make it obvious to you. He is the beginning and the end, all right? Okay. <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> There's another account of another incident of Xenoglossy with him as well. It was when he was a 19-year-old monk. Chowate noticed that villagers around the monastery were speaking Boatian. Was that one of the ones he knew before for business? Yes. He approached the villagers and found that he can converse with them very fluently even though he was not taught Loatian. So more of the same. Yeah, because he drew on his past life knowledge. Very interesting story. Now, of course, as he grows older, now, a lot of times you hear, like, for example, in the James Langer case, the memories fade heavily, but they can still kind of remember them. Yeah, I, re I remember, like, the majority of them is, like, starts to fade at, like, six years old, I think it was. Mm -hmm. But, like, some go beyond that. Well, obviously, he's doing the stuff at 19 and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Now, this is where it's different. As he grew older, the memories of his life as Nai Lang did not fade at all, which he attributed to his dedication to the practice of meditation over the course of two lifetimes. Chuate finally died in 1976 at the age of 68 years, and he was also one of the most respected monks and abbots in Thailand. Well, then my opinion at the end is going to piss some people off. But I'm going to recap the uh, source. Obviously, all of Chuate's accounts are from his autobiography, uh, but the main case is from Past Life Memories and Childhood. Researchers Francis Story and Ian Stevenson, MD, is from the book Cases of the Reincarnation Type, Volume 4, Thailand and Burma. All right, so what's your opinion on it? You love it, right? Um... Case closed. It's real. Well, no, I, I, I think it's a very good possibility it's real. The only concern I have with it not being real is, does all of the information just come from him? If it doesn't, and there's people who can vouch for what he's saying, like you, I don't, I don't like to say credible witnesses, because let's be honest, like a guy who's half blind and, and, and can barely hear a thing can be a more credible witness than someone with perfect vision. And, and Are you doubting a Buddhist monk? Would he lie to you? I constantly doubt the Buddhist monks. And, <laughs> and anybody who doesn't have doubt about the Buddhist you should look into the Dalai Lama. And you, you have some doubts about Buddhist monks. Again, he's picking on the Dalai Lama. Oh, my God. Yeah, it never stops. <laughs> um, there, and there's a lot of propaganda to smear guys like him as well. I mean, okay, so let's, let's assume that all can be independently verified. You know what works just as well as remembering things from a previous life? What? Having a cheat sheet. But his family said he was reborn. Let me get this straight. This guy subverts the standard practice and procedure that usually goes along with reincarnation. He subverts all of that. He's, the rules change just for him. And then he gets into a... So if the child is born, the child is there. According to the Buddhist, that child should have a soul, right? I don't know. You tell me. I'm not as up on Buddhism as I, well, I would like to be, but what happened to the child? Is the child not a separate? He, no, he inhabited both at the same time. It split reincarnation, dude. Okay. So basically, so he inhabited both and controlled, right? He controlled both. So was the child's spirit, soul, whatever you want to call it. I, I'm not sure what they would summarize it as in Buddhism. Was it a slave? Here, let's think of it this way. So he was sick before uh Chowete was born right so maybe correct his soul was already transitioning because it said that he looked at the child and was gonna leave and then it kind of triggered like that was like okay now it's time to move time's up like it triggered like he was supposed to be there but eventually it triggered on its own and pulled him in oh what about the personality swing you know what I mean? Like, here he is. He's Mr. Farmer. He's Mr. Buddhist Monk. He's, he's, he's this guy and he's that guy. And then suddenly he dies and I am, you know, I am the Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. Like, 
What kind of language is that? He just felt good, dude. I'm sure he just felt good. If I wanted to mess up people's life and I was some sort of entity, I would get a patsy, throw them into the body of some, somebody or something that can't defend themselves, whether that soul gets destroyed or pushed out. And then I would, I would manipulate that person by leaving little holes in their memory during the right periods. And when they needed to remember something, they'd get a cheat sheet from me. So all would appear well. Now, I wouldn't concern myself uh, with the fact that they're violating the rules of how things work because they would just give a, a weave a convincing enough story. Why do, is he able to do this and no one else is? Why does he get to be the exception? Why do the, do the structure and the rules of the way everything work? It ceased to be for this very, very special person. Whenever something like that happens, it always makes a question whether or not this is a natural process, because it doesn't seem like it follows the natural rules, at least ac according to the Buddhists. I don't know. I mean, and what, what a surprise. He rises to a, a position of prominence. And you're so triggered. <laughs> I, I'm triggered because this is so glaringly obvious that something was wrong. Just a story about the child, for Christ's sake. He is a skulker. He is a lurker in that place. And there is a, a tiny baby who's just started life. And suddenly this guy's in control. What about the baby's personality? What about the development of that spirit, that soul? Oh, no. Uh, forget about them. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm important. That sounds like a fucking demon. He was just excited about his new omnipotence. It sounds too good to be true. It's too, it's, it's not true. All right. You're skeptical. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not skeptical that it can happen. I'm skeptical of his true nature. I think he was a baddie. All right. You think he was a baddie. I think, uh, he was a creep. No, we did that. Yeah. He was definitely kind of I think creepy. he was a little, a little creepy as a spirit. Yeah. Are you ready? Get ready for this one. All right. So I, I remember this story from years and years ago, and I remember it being reported on the news and it was always so stupid. <laughs> they would be like, oh, there's a boy who remembered his murderer on uh, that's it. And he got his murderer convicted, right? He recognized his, the murderer of his previous body, outed him, and he got convicted. And that was the story from the news. And that was it. OK, OK, that, that was the whole story. When you look up the story, uh, there's no sources. There's nothing. It's just, yep, that happened. <laughs> oh, that's because I made it up. Yeah, I have great news from you. How the case was derived. Past life memories and childhood. The researcher is Eli Lash, MD. This is from the book Children Who Have Lived It Before by Trutz Hardo. And it is the original account of where that story comes from. How did you find that? I don't know. Okay. Accident. However, there is one issue with it that, of course, the media had no problem with. <laughs> Eli Lash was intentionally vague because he didn't want people going out there and harassing the boy, doing research, and he just wanted to record the story and let them be. Okay. Because it's a very small village, apparently. That's fair enough. Eli Lash. Das liegt kein Uber, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your German is exquisite. That's, uh, I guess that's the book title. Okay. The prominent physician, uh, yeah, Eli Lash, MD, was a prominent physician in Israel who served as a senior consultant on the coordination of health services in the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. He passed in 2009. One of the things he did is he investigated a reincarnation case in which a young boy remembered his past life, in which he was murdered. By being hit in the head with an axe. Ooh. Now, the boy whose name was not reported was born with a long red birthmark on his head. Uh, the boy's parents belonged to the Druze religion, which features reincarnation as a fundamental tenant. The Druze live primarily in the Golan Heights region, adjacent to Syria, which uh, is the location of the boy's birth. When the boy was born, like I said, he has this birthmark scar on his head. Very identifiable. Yes. When he was three years old, the boy told his parents that he was killed in a past lifetime by being struck on the head with an axe. From what the boy told the parents as well as other relatives, it was thought the boy lived nearby in his past incarnation. So his father, along with some relatives and the elders of the village, 
decided to visit the neighboring communities to see if they could discern his past life identity. So Dr. Losh. Did he do some investigating? He did some investigating. Dr. Losh was invited to join the group. That's where we get the account from. Because uh, he was known to be very interested in reincarnation. So the group arrives to a neighboring village. The group then asked the boy if he recognized the location of his prior home. This was not his past life village. So the group continued on to the next village. So the group travels on village after village until they get to the third village. And the boy states that this village is where he lived. He says this is the neighborhood where he used to live. And now he goes on to be able to name several individuals from his past life here. Now, at this point, the boy now remembered his own first and last name, as well as the first and last name of his murderer. Oh, that makes things easier. Now, as a member of the community, that says, so the previous incarnation of the boy, he knows him. He lived there, but he disappeared four years ago and was never found. So now the boy is giving you a name of a disappeared person. Yeah. So here we go. A lot of people assume that the person must have come to some misfortune, as it was known individuals in that area were be killed or taken prisoner in the border areas between Israel and Syria for being suspected of spies. Say it ain't so. Yeah, say it ain't so. The group now goes through the village, and the boy points out the house of his past life. So curious bystanders start coming around and hanging out. And then the boy suddenly walks up to a man and calls him by his name. The man acknowledged that the boy correctly named him, and the boy said, I used to be your neighbor. We had a fight, and you killed me with an axe. Ooh, big mistake. So Dr. Lash uh, then observed that this man's face suddenly became white as a sheet. The three-year-old then stated, I even know where he buried my body. The boy then led the group, which includes the accused murderer, into the fields that were located nearby. The boy stopped in front of a pile of stones and reported, He buried my body under these stones, and the axe is over there. Oh, snap. Excavation at the spot of the stones revealed a skeleton of an adult man wearing the clothes of a farmer, and on the skull, a linear split in the skull was observed, which was consistent with an axe wound. Jesus, and he would have got away with it, too, if it wasn't for that kid. If it were for that meddling kid, he would have gotten away with it. These dudes are riding through these towns in the mystery machine, shagging scuba in the back, and is this a town? And it's like, nope. Is this a town? Nope. And they get to the town, and they find out it's it's Farmer Joe the whole time. Yeah. Holy crap. That's kind of interesting. It goes on. Dr. Lash reports that it at this point, everyone in the group stared at the accused murderer, Oh, <laughs> who then admitted in front of everyone that he did commit this crime. Okay. The group then went to the location where the boy stated the murder weapon was hidden, and upon digging, they indeed found the axe. Wow. Dr. Lash asked the group what would become of the murderer. He was told they would not turn him over to the police. Rather, they would impose a suitable punishment. What ultimately happened to the murderer was not reported. <laughs> oh, jeez. Have you ever seen the videos of what goes on? No. And that the villages take care of it themselves? Ho, ho, ho. You haven't seen brutality. Good God. Maybe he should have said, nah. Nah, it didn't happen. And then, like, when they went to go check it out, he should have just, like, sidestepped away from the crowd and kind of disappeared into into the desert or something maybe right when the kid said you killed me he should have turned around and ran full speed yeah just turn around and bolt (laughs) but yeah like i said uh from children who have lived before by true tardo that's interesting dr eli lash's notes there that that kid is within the acceptable like the alleged acceptable range of still remembering that stuff i'm guessing that he probably doesn't remember any of these things is clearly after the age of six. Yeah. Because, like, the, the common thing is that the kids are kind of, like, half here, half in the previous place for at least the first couple of years. But given that there's no names, Ian Stevenson, MD, uh, as well as his colleagues at the University of Virginia, uh, said that the testimony of multiple witnesses was carefully documented. Uh, this case lacks, but though this case lacks evidentiary detail. 
Yeah. So, for example, the subject name, the murder name, the witnesses are not provided, which makes the case anecdotal at best. But great story. It is a good story. You gotta kind of have to take it to faith, but that kind of is the same with all of this stuff, you know. That brings us into past life scars or birthmarks. People who have been killed or died in an accident where you hear the stories of, you know, ancient times, I was killed by a spear, and now they have a birthmark on their chest, which kind of looks like an entrance wound, right? Right. So like we said in the story, the kid had that red birthmark on his head where the axe hit him in his previous life, and it carried over. Imagine having an argument that carries over into the next life. <laughs> That's a hell of an argument. All right, so let's get into our final story here, where we're going to talk about Suzanne Gunnam. Gunnam? Suzanne Gunnam. Gunnam. G-H-A-N-E-M. Oh, gotcha. Okay. This is another case that Ian Stevenson covered. Yeah, I got to give the link to uh, their parapsychology department as well, but there's another case from Ian Stevenson, and it has to do with Hannon Mansour. So who is Hannah Mansour? She was born in Lebanon somewhere in the mid-1930s. She married, had some children. Now the thing is, she developed heart problems. And the doctor specifically told her, do not get pregnant again. Your heart cannot handle it. So she got pregnant again. Well, as you would. As you would. Yeah, I think, I think she gave birth. And she needed surgery. She needed heart surgery. But she had to go to Virginia to get the surgery. That's a hike. Yeah, that's a hike. Now, her brother lived in Virginia, so she had a place to stay at least. Before the surgery, though, she told her brother that if anything should happen, divide her jewelry up and give it to her daughters. And she was also trying to call her daughter, Layla, before the surgery, but she was never able to get through. Unfortunately, she goes to the surgery, doesn't make it, dies. The family's pretty torn up. Now, 10 days later, Suzanne Ghanem was born. Just so you know, she was also born in the Lebanon area. Now, before she was able to read or write, she would scribble numbers. Take a guess what numbers she scribbled. Probably, so, well, I'm guessing something related to the recently departed. Yes, winning lottery numbers. Oh. Really? <laughs> no, no. Could, could you imagine that? I was going to say, you can't scribble that. They're rigged anyway. So... <laughs> No, but she turned out to be writing Hanan's phone number. She was writing Hanan's phone number. The only thing was there was two digits transposed. But she kept writing this phone number. Because remember, she was trying to call her daughter before the surgery. Oh, okay. Right? And when she was a toddler, she used to pick up the phone and try to call Layla. Oh. And yeah, and she would ask for Layla on the phone. Just picking it up and not, you know. And when the parents noticed this, they would say, who is Layla? We don't know a Layla. And Susan would reply, Layla is my daughter. Wow, that's, that's weird to hear as a parent. And then they would ask her, you know, well, what do you mean by this? And she's quoted as saying, ask me when my head is bigger. Perhaps I'll tell you. Wait, one more time. Ask me what is bigger? Ask me when my head is bigger. That's such a weird thing to say. Maybe they mean brain. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, I imagine that's what she means. Yeah. All this weird stuff's going on. Okay. So within one year, she was able to name her old name, Hanan Mansour, as well as the name of her husband, who was a police officer, as well as 13 relatives. Jeez. Yeah, that, that's a lot. That's a lot. She's able to name the place where she used to live, and she was able to give enough information to her now new family, the Ghanem family, that they were able to make contact with the Mansour family. Susan was able to name everyone, everyone, and knew about the jewelry being divided up before her death. The husband would test her, right? Because, you know, he's a police officer. He doesn't want to get scammed here. And he would test her by showing her old pictures of them at parties. And Susan and Suzanne could name all of their friends in all of the photos. Okay, that's creep show, man. This was studied in the 1960s, and one of the anecdotal things from that is, you know, this little girl, Susan, is sitting in her old husband's lap, being all affectionate like they're still married. Oh, that's okay, we're getting into weird. Yeah, so that, and yeah, so like, you know, of course, the previous husband couldn't believe it. Yeah, that's, 
I mean, it's depressing too, because if you honestly do believe that your wife is trapped in another body, there's literally nothing you can do about it. Imagine having to say goodbye to somebody who's died, but they're not really dead, but they're basically dead to you. That's rough. Yeah, that was studied by Ian Stevenson in the 1960s, because uh, he had been doing that for 40 years. He must have, I mean, at least some of it may have had to have some value because it obviously caught his attention. Like nobody, well, very few people go into that sort of thing, especially if they have good credentials and think, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to do this. You know what I mean? Like that's something that pulls you in. Exactly. Um, And he studied a lot of cases and he studied, he has 1,200 cases that he says are considered solved, meaning that there's so much evidence he says, yes, this person was indeed reincarnated. 1,200 of them. That's wild. It is wild. Oh, God, I'm, I'm going to be a cockroach when I come back. I know I am. Nuh-uh, don't come back. It's all a trap. The whole reincarnation thing's a trap. Get out of it. Oh, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I'm just going to get out of it. Just get out of it. When they ask me to reincarnate, I'm going to be like, nope. You got to get it. You got to call in sick. Yeah. yeah. They expect you to be there. Don't show up. I'm not going to be a, a, a life slave. This is I'm not a wage slave for reincarnation. It's interesting. So we know your thoughts on uh, the Buddhist. You know, he's you think he's a demon, apparently. I, I, do, I do not think he's a human. No, I think he's a creep. Yeah. What do you think about uh... the boy found his killer? It's not the first time I've heard a story like that. I'd have to go back and check it out because it's, it's, it's hell to track these, these things down again. Because basically when you find your stories are links upon links upon links. And then like you're looking at somebody's journal or something. But I remember a story in which um, a confirmed case where a woman had been had gone under deep hypnosis. And she had recalled a previous life where she was a, a young man who had gotten another girl in the village pregnant. And... They wanted to get together and have a family, but the families forbid it. And the girl ended up committing suicide by throwing herself down a well. And the uh, so the woman got the information on where this was, and it was an abandoned village. It was located in the woods, and everything was. And there was some lumber and things like that, but there was there was nothing left. It was an old village that just disappeared off the face of the earth, other than wreckage. She was able to pinpoint the well and. That was, it had been buried. It had already been covered up and it was gone. She pointed out where it was going to be. So they dig up the well and they find the, what must have been a very heavily pregnant woman, uh, her skeleton at the bottom with, of course, the obvious signs that she had been pregnant. And from what I understand, now we're going back because I had heard this story years and years and years ago, but it was, as far as I understood, a confirmed case. Which is wild. Yeah. There's not a lot of explanations for finding a previously buried well that had been undisturbed for, I want to say, like 50, 60 years at least. Did the kid thing too fits into that particular criteria? They're young enough to still kind of be half there and half here, a little bit of half and half. So they still have, so the memories haven't been wiped yet. They can still recall some things, especially the more traumatic they are. They were called that. That's a common theme. That's and that's not in any particular culture. We're not just talking about people who are Buddhist. We're not just talking about uh, Hindu. We're talking about people all over all walks of life, all religions. Sometimes very opposed to that particular uh, point of view. It's consistent and usually, strangely enough, the cutoff cutoff age is about six years old. And after about six, you start to lose all of it. Like you're getting like the hard drive's getting wiped. Yeah, because I've heard uh, there's like a spiritual cycle to the human soul. It's like every seven years or so. So six, seven years old is a is like your first cycle, and that's when you kind of like lose that in between, right? It's it's fascinating, and and I'm not gonna talk about my personal beliefs in it. I think at the very least, there's some very abnormal things in it that are seem pretty believable. In any other case, while it's not you know, a, a quantifiable mathematical number you can you can attach to something. It's it's the equivalent of a smoking gun in a murder case. You know what I mean? Like it's it's good enough, you know? And that was that was always the thing. We've we've talked about this privately as well, where I've said like, okay, you've got circumstantial evidence. Well you've got a whole planet doing a, that has an astronomical, almost uncountable amount of circumstantial evidence. At what point do you 
pile up enough circumstantial evidence for something to just be a fact. You know what I mean? Like we could sit around and call dark matter dark matter, and we don't even know what dark matter is. It seems to be a catch-all, yeah, for things you can't explain. But we can have something that has, you know, is at least more verifiable in this stuff. At least, again, on a circumstantial basis, you have some things that you can attach to it, and that is all fantasy. I mean, you can say some things like, like. You know, you can say, like, I am the beginning and the end, and that's you saying something. And then you can prove it by finding a well or finding people from the past life. That's that's actions. That's different, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, there's, there's loads and loads of stuff. I'll post a link to uh, the University of Virginia's uh, School of Medicine for their D- Division of Perceptual Studies, and they have their publications there. And you can just go through loads and loads of stuff. Yeah. I, I I can't imagine how much there is now because I remember delving into this about a decade ago, and even then there was just, it was overwhelming amount of information. Overwhelming, it's crazy. They have uh, articles not just on reincarnation either, but uh, near death experiences, uh, mind body relationships, um, parapsychology. I mean, just all kinds of yummy stuff. What's your opinion about what? Well, first I want to hear your opinion on the first guy. I want to know what you think. No hiding behind your narrator voice. Tell me what you think. Give the viewer your opinion. Well, look, I don't even like the idea of reincarnation. I know you don't. You hate it. Right? Because it's not prison planet, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. But, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Like, for example, the the kid who identified his own murderer. Yeah. If that story's true, that's incredible. Yeah, it's wild. You know, that's kind of like, you know, now there's no question about it, especially if he wasn't preloaded. Like, because a lot of times you hear of some stories where the parents, they don't mean to do it and they're not even aware they're doing it, but they preload the kid with stuff. And there's been examples of that. Yeah. And kids are very perceptive. And you never know what they're going to pick up on and stick on. You may you may say something to a kid and completely forget about it, that it ever even happened. But in the kid's head, that, that's like a core memory. Well, it's, it's those bowls full of mush that got in their head, man. That, that's why they're so good at learning languages. Like the, the best time to learn a language is when you're super, super young because it just gets absorbed. Even things you would think they would remember, they remember. So, yeah, I mean, preloading is a, a definite factor. Susan one's interesting. I didn't get what Ian Stevenson's particularly said about it. But, you know, again, if, if that's all verifiable, again, that's insane. Right. And I don't know if reincarnation is going to, I don't know if it's a universal thing, but from what I, you know, from stuff I've read and from what I've heard, it is. And that's why the cabal is pushing materialism so that you don't reincarnate. You just reincarnate as a Bigfoot. (laughs) Is it a Bigfoot Nephilim? I don't know. Uh, If I'm going to be a Bigfoot, I want to be a Nephilim. I don't want to be like the panty sniffing Bigfoot. Like, I at least want to be like, you know, top tier Bigfoot. Not that Sam much. You still smell like crap. Well, uh, poopy pants. What about Mister the the first guy, the 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 Buddhist thing? What do you what do you think about all that is about? I find a lot of the Buddhist stuff interesting. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting story, but given that it's entirely from the perspective of Chowate. Yeah. I mean, but you know, if if his family says no, 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 we brought in the aunt and we brought in you know the family members and you know it's. So it's interesting. So you pretty much have to go by what the family says about it. So if the family says, yeah, he's absolutely reborn. You know what I mean? What can you do? Yeah, it, you, you kind of do have to take it at face value. I mean, there's only so much you can do with those sort of time periods. I mean, heck, we're talking about guys in the village, too. I'm sure they didn't even keep adequate records of births and deaths, you know? They're, they're interesting. I, I wonder if all of this stuff... Like you know how there's a lot of people who do who do this kind of work, and there's always those predictions that we're coming towards an error where things are going to be revealed, and our understanding of things is going to change because the the things that people deny, as far as, as you know, spiritual things are going to be undeniable. I wonder if if that does happen. I I wonder if that will be a product of our technology keeping adequate records, you know, being able to to nail down facts because everything is archived now. And, and these other things have been going on for so long, finally interacting with each other. 
So like this stuff becomes provable. Like someone says, this person said this, and then maybe, you know, they go somewhere and a videotape is in the house and they're saying the thing they said on the videotape of which there's only one copy. Like, I wonder if that stuff starts popping up more to kind of like force people. Okay, this is actually a thing. But then there's delusion too. And and people, you know, whether it's true or whether it's false, people try to retain their worldview and they will literally kill so they don't have to change their worldview. Yeah, because in Ian Stevenson's time, I mean, now so much is recorded and well recorded. But in his time, you know, that wasn't going on. It would take another researcher like him to re-delve into this world of reincarnation. And good luck with that, because if you're trying to do something like he's doing these days, they're going to try to destroy your career. Because in his day, he had to go back and get like old autopsy records and like dig through like, you know, mounds of paperwork. And well, we're talking about physically going there and doing it, too. I mean, just the travel time alone is, is probably a significant amount of years for all those cases. Just travel. You got to live it. You got to live it. Well, there's an authenticity to that as well. You know, getting your hands in the dirt. It's cool, though. It's it's one of the most fascinating paranormal subjects, I think, is reincarnation because it's so consistent across cultures. Oh, uh, you like the stories. I liked him a lot. Shame about that demon in the first story. He was just a creep. <laughs> He's just a lurker. He's just a lurker. Leave him alone. He just wanted to see his sister's baby. Where's the baby at? Oh, God. Oh, no. My sister saw me. I better hide. Oh, God. Ugh. That's it for this episode of Bell Midnight. Hope you enjoyed. We'll be back with uh, Holographic Universe or maybe some Bigfoot stories. <laughs> you can rely on me for trash. I'll, I'll, I'll deliver trash. Don't worry. About it. All right. That's it. Later. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much, feel too little. Don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. 